The Sal Sertia Show, the mayor of rock and roll. Folks, here we go again. Uh, welcome to the South Search Your Show, the mayor of rock and roll, which is yours truly and me. Uh, <laughs> this is show number six. Uh, this is, it just goes to show, by doing this show, you can't believe how fast the weeks are going by because it feels like I was doing this yesterday. And tonight, man, we got an incredible show, and it's just getting bigger and bigger. I'd also like to say that Joanne Mathis, the one who runs the whole show, the one who's on, on the other end right now who handles all the uh, technical stuff and plays all the music and gets it all happening, uh, she told us, me tonight, that being our show is getting so big and so many people are tuning in that we are able to do one hour tonight. And uh, I know you're all clapping your hands in the living room in California and L.A., Japan, London. So, <laughs> But anyway, tonight... I better shut up. I'm talking too much. We only have an hour. I better get this rolling, right? We have a Grammy Award winner, producer, engineer, performer. Uh, He's performed and toured the world, playing guitar with uh, known known, uh, artists, including Tracy Chapman, Billy Squire, which is also a friend of mine, Rick Ocasek. For those of you who are probably saying who's Rick Ocasek, uh, he's the uh, guitar player and lead singer for The Cars. How could you not know? Shake it up. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Larry Mitchell uh, did a record with him. I remember when they were doing it. Uh, Coolio and many, many more. And uh, he's got tons of his own solo albums. And um, matter of fact, he's also in the video with Sandra Bernhardt. Oh, uh, God. Yeah. When she did this video. <laughs> uh, you got to check it out. It's on YouTube. I watched it the other night. Anyway, let me introduce. Well, you don't have to introduce him. He's known worldwide. My good old friend, brother Larry Mitchell. Hello. Brother Larry. Hey, Sal. How you oh, doing? Oh, man, I can't believe how good you sound. You're in Alabama, and you sound like you're right around the corner. Yeah, well, it's not that far. <laughs> really? I mean, corner, can, uh, can I walk far. there? Or I don't think so, right? It's no, not, especially I mean. it's cold out tonight. You don't want to do that. <laughs> Brother Larry, you know, me and Larry have been friends. We were just talking about that uh, before before we got on the air. Uh, since, like, 1982 or 83, yeah. uh, I met Larry when he had a cover band with Leo Rizzo, and who was Jack. also uh, a great uh, keyboard player and singer. Mm-hmm. Big he, uh, yeah, I hope he's tuned in, brother, uh, brother Leo. I hope you're there. And he also played with Debbie Gibson on yeah. tour with Debbie Gibson, which I met her uh, a few months ago, and we uh, were talking about Leo Rizzo. She was getting a kick out of that. And uh, there <laughs> were a, a cover band that did Rush stuff, and that's when I first met Larry. Yep. And uh, brother Larry, let's go. Let's go back to the beginning. I know you for so many years, but I never really asked you in all those years. You know, what was your influences to play guitar, or were you into playing a different instrument and then decide to play guitar? Was guitar your first love? Um, I always I had a toy guitar as a kid, um, and then I got I wanted to play drums, and I had a drum set. My mom threw it out the window. You know what? I you know you just said that, and you just reminded me you you just something snapped that I remember you telling that story mm-hmm. on the on TV when you were on what's what's that woman's name with the raspy voice? I keep forgetting the name. The blonde uh, that you were on a show that time with uh, the guy Nerver. from BMG. You know. Joan oh, Nerver. what's her name? She's very famous. The blonde woman with the raspy voice. Joan Rivers. Joan Rivers. <laughs> I remember watching you on the Joan Rivers show that day. And you told her that you were going to play the drums, and it got thrown out the window. You just reminded me of that with that. Yeah. Joan Rivers show. Yes. So, yep. so the yep. dr- well, you know, the drums are noisy. I could see where they would throw them out the window. She was a no-playing mom. She said, I, you know, don't hit those drums anymore. I'm trying to watch TV. You hit them one more time, they're going out the window. And, and they sure did, and they really did, huh? They flew. Mom Stop don't play flying. around. <laughs> But, uh, so yeah, now, but I started playing guitar, and then uh, I've been playing since, you know, kind of seriously playing since I was nine, I guess. All right, at and, nine years old, who you, who was like your guitar heroes? Who 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 you wanna, you know, who who the guys you would listen to at nine years old? You know, at nine, I I wasn't even aware of like guitar heroes. I was just trying to play guitar. Right. And um, there was a guy on a block named Brown, named Mark Brown, who uh, showed me a, a song, 
and um, that's kind of got got started. There was a band next door called Brass Construction that used to rehearse. They were they were they had like a hit, I believe. Um, and just anybody with a guitar was pretty fascinating to me. Anybody with an instrument, musical instrument was pretty fascinating. Yeah, and at nine around. years old, where were you living at nine years old? Were you in New York or Alabama? Uh, New York, Brooklyn. That was the last year of Brooklyn, and then um, then then we moved to Far Rockaway, Queens. So I just moved to, to Alabama um, two years ago. Oh, okay. I didn't know if you were born in, born over there and then moved to New York and decided to go back. I wasn't sure. What I, I knew you, you know, I've always known you were in, in New York. That's how I know you for so many years. But I thought maybe when you moved to Alabama, I said, well, maybe he was born and raised there and came to New York to you know to work and go back. You know, went back to live there again. I had no idea. I wasn't nope. sure. You know. No, nope, no. Nope. My mom is from here. So. I'm oh, here. okay. So um. Hang all right. Now, mom. now uh, you were playing guitar at nine. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you got as you started playing guitar, you got a little bit older, and you, you had to start listening to who guys like like who that really uh, influenced you to play guitar. You know, not to play guitar, but who was the guys you started really getting into and picking the up first, all different styles. The first person probably was Prince. I remember hanging out um, <laughs> with this girl, you know, you're being a young boy and, uh, you know, just kind of hanging out with this girl. And all of a sudden she she put on this Prince record. And all of a sudden I, I was more interested in the Prince record <laughs> than, yeah. than hanging out with her. I was like, what, what what's this? What is, and, I, you know, I borrowed that record, and I don't know if I ever gave it back to her. Sherelle Mackey. <laughs> oh, oh, Sherelle Mackey. Sherelle, you're out there, I owe you a Prince record. I'm sorry. <laughs> she she might be listening. She's gonna probably call you up and say, "Where's my album?" Even though she probably <laughs> don't have a turntable no more, but she probably want her album back. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> now, Prince is a great guitar player. For, I mean, I've seen him oh, yeah. actually play, and he could really play. You know? Oh yeah, yeah. No, he was great. And then from Prince, he went to Van Halen. Mm-hmm. So. Now now okay, well that's true. Uh, I, I would say you're a lot younger than I am. So guys like. Uh, Alvin Lee and Jimmy Page, that was a little, you were much younger, right? I mean, that, because you, you got more into Prince and Van Halen. Those those kind of guitar players came on a bit later on in my world, you know, in uh, terms of the people. Because I'm, I'm 53, so I, I started, you know, as a kid. I was, I was like so many kids, the Beatles and the Who and, you know, Jimi Hendrix and Cheap Trick and, all, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. And, um yeah, that's why I became a singer, a songwriter as well, just like you. And uh, those were my influences because I was, you know, in 1964, I saw the Beatles for the first time on Ed Sullivan show. And like a million other kids, you saw John Lennon, you know, bopping with the guitars like, oh, that's cool, you know. Yeah. That, yeah. Now, I got into that that much later in high school. Um, I kind of went backwards into, uh, into you know, older music at that point. And once I got into Van Halen, then I got into Zeppelin and Page a little bit and, um and then in that band, uh, Courier, that was the name of the band. Courier, that was the, the Rush cover band, Courier. Rush cover band. So I got into Rush, obviously, and Alex Lifeson. I'm still an Alex Lifeson fan. Um, we also started doing, you know, we were playing those shows. We did, I don't know, I remember how many Rush songs we did, but it was a lot. And I just remember we decided, you know, there's no girls that come to these shows. <laughs> Let's do some, some. We just started doing some The Police and uh, Zebra and Triumph and stuff like that. And uh, so I got into other guitar plays then. And um, Andy Summers, big, big into Andy Summers back in back in those days. Um, right. And then uh, some Hendrix and Santana. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Uh, I was a big Nile Rodgers fan. I still am. And, oh, and Nile, Nile, my brother Nile, man, he's yeah, the best. <laughs> yeah, Nile produced that Rick Classic record, so it was uh, it was pretty uh, it was pretty cool working with Nile that way. Just that's you know, right. You know, I, I totally forgot that he produced that album because mm-hmm. I was hanging out with you around the whole time that you were doing that. And um, I remember I was talking with Nile Rodgers at China Club, and then he was telling me that he was working with you and Rick Classic on that. And I to- just forgot that so much stuff was going on. That you know, just like as I'm getting old, like I can't remember things like I used to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand. I'm not that far behind you. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, but but you know what? It's fine, you know, and you listen to so many guitar plays, and the truth is, and I'm, I probably a lot of people say, you know, I think that you picked up so many different styles, and you you know, 
you, you like probably uh, you know if there's ten of the best guitar players in the world, you're definitely one of them. Oh, thank there's you. No doubt I don't about know about that, but thank you. Well, thank no, you. I do because I mean, when I watch you play, and you have such full control of like every, the way you play, you're like so you're so full control of the guitar. You know, you don't. You, you, it's just so clean, and you always got a great sound, and it's just like you could see it. You're so relaxed on stage. I mean, I've seen you play a million times, <laughs> and you have full control of that guitar and the way you bop and everything. It's just like, you know, and you're, you, you've always been a straight guy. I've known Larry, for those of you who have listened, me and Larry go back since the early 80s. Mm -hmm. Larry never did drugs in his life. Nope. Never drank, never nope. smoked pot, never nope. smoked cigarettes. You were like the cleanest musician that I've ever met. <laughs> I mean, I, I, even me, I smoked cigarettes back then. I had a drink here and there, but you... You were like, and you still are the same way, and that's yeah, why. Yeah, can't do it, can't do it. So that's why you're playing, and it's so amazing because I mean, a lot of those players in the old days, you know, I mean, I was watching this Woodstock thing the other day where Santana said he was on drugs so bad that the, he was holding on to the guitar neck, but it felt like a snake to him, like it was moving around while he was playing it, <laughs> and he couldn't wild. hold on to it right. Wow. <laughs> I was laughing. I said, that's why now you, I remember watching Woodstock and I'm seeing Santana moving around strange like he's holding the guitar like it's going to fly away. And he said it right on the interview. He said, I did got, I got so, did so much drugs that I didn't even, I, I didn't know we were supposed to go on yet at Woodstock. And I asked him, can you guys go on now? Because he had no other band to go on. And he was so stoned that he, he got up there and he played. He said, the neck was wobbling like, like, like rubber. As he was looking at it, and he could, he's trying to hold on to it while he's while he's playing the notes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you know, you you well, as a straight straight guy, you have like your fingers just glide and and so beautiful, man. It's like I I just been watching the uh, the 1991 gig because mm -hmm. I just I was at a lot of those gigs when you played uh, in 1991 when the first CD came out, and. Um, uh, I, I just watch your hands. I'm saying, Jesus Christ, Larry just flows, man. His fingers just like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, but just, just going back for a second. So I, I've never done drugs, but there was a time on the Billy Squire tour where um, I'm allergic to MSG. And usually, you know, some people have like nightmares. Mm -hmm. So I had an MSG trip at a Billy Squire show. And actually, I looked behind my rack. I thought something was wrong with my guitar sound. So I pulled my rack around in the middle of a song and. I thought the cables were snakes. <laughs> Wait a minute, that, that kind of yeah, allergic. Oh, I was I was crying on stage. I thought the audience wanted to kill us. I was just having a bad, just a bad MSG trip. <laughs> and then oh. I, I I accused somebody on the tour of, of uh, someone there was hanging out with the tour of uh, of uh, spiking me, but they didn't. It was just it was the MSG. Wow, that's wild. And it was never... like a living nightmare. <laughs> it was a bad dream. <laughs> and I know, I remember cigarettes, I remember hanging, me and you would be hanging out, and people were smoking cigarettes those days everywhere, and you, you couldn't take that either. I mean, I used to smoke no. myself. Now I can't take it no more either, but I remember running out of the club with you, because you were like, you couldn't take the cigarettes no more. And I said, Larry, you all right? Remember that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I had bad asthma. I couldn't breathe. Me and no, you ran out to the street uh, together at the, on Broadway there in Manhattan. Yeah, I had a little, uh, I don't know if you remember the, uh, what was that club, Casper's Club in, uh, February's. February's. So most of the times I played February's, I had a small oxygen tank. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember seeing that little green oxygen tank. I do. I do remember Which perfectly. Was crazy to think about what all those people would smoke cigarette smokes in there. <laughs> cigarette smoke in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I remember you had the little green tank sitting right next mm -hmm. to you in case if the, if the cigarettes got to you, and uh, you would run off. The, uh, you ran, ran out to the door one time with, uh, with and I came to make sure you were okay. Yeah. And that was at the China Club. But February, yeah, February is like a cloud of smoke. I mean, I used to run jams there. I did jams there for like two, three years. Every one. You even came to a few of those jams. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was oh, yeah. great. So let's, let's get back to Brother Larry, because I, I, I intend to uh, start talking about things that I did, too. I, mean, I can't help it. But I guess it's because every guest that I've had so far, except for, uh, except for Rich San Giovanni, that we just became friends. Every guest before that's people I've known for 20, 30 years. Like, you know, so yeah. we were able to start mayor. talking about the things we've done. Yeah, you're the mayor. So everybody <laughs> knows you. You know everybody. <laughs> yeah, and Larry's now, you've been touring again now, right? I have since moving to uh, 
Alabama to spend more time with my mom. Um, the day I got here, pretty much, I did a guitar clinic at a local music store and met my current rhythm section that I play with around the South and Southeast and Southwest. And actually, we've come up to Boston and New York a couple of times with Last year and a um, little bit the year before as well, uh, Russ Garner and Austin Solomon, and um, they're both from New Jersey. So we're the I joke we're the, the band from the South that's not really from the South. So I, I met those guys that when I, at the guitar clinic I was doing, and they got up and jammed with me, and we had a, a blast. And uh, we've been in a van traveling. We did a lot of playing last year, and uh, it was great. We had a lot of fun, and um, we're looking to do some more playing this year. Great. Larry, hold on. No, we've got to go to a commercial. We'll be right back with the great okay. Larry Mitchell. All right. Here is a well-documented fact. Humans spend approximately 33% of life in bed. That's a good reason to consider bringing your bed into the 21st century with Function All Linens. They'll change your bedtime forever. Designed for every kind of bedtime you can imagine, these fun and functional bed sheets have his and her side pockets that hold pretty much everything but the kitchen sink. The pockets allow you to have your cell phone, iPad, remotes, and anything else you need within your fingertips reach at all times. No more cluttered nightstands. No more fumbling around in the dark. Simply reach for your pocket. Experience the affordable comfort and pure luxury that only Function All Linens can offer. For more information or to order, visit functionall-linens.com or beddazzle.com. Every person who has a home desires to live in beauty, harmony, and comfort, says Valentina of Valentina Interiors and Designs. In business since 1990, Italian-born designer Valentina has been producing interiors and exteriors designs to suit and embrace mind, soul, body, and functionality. Beauty without functionality is only daydreaming. Valentina creates realities. Valentina's goal as an interior designer is to touch and transform people's lives while transforming their spaces. Visit her at www.valentinadesigns.com or call for design consultations online and in home, 650-346-6349. It sounds like we're back, and I could hear Larry playing a little guitar there. Larry, you got a guitar in your hand? Of course, always. Well, give us a couple of licks. Go ahead. Let's play it. Let's play it a little bit, brother. Oh, oh yeah, fun. baby. Now, now I feel like jamming. I don't want to even be on the radio anymore. I want to come and do some, <laughs> some jamming. <laughs> yeah, now, you gotta jam, by, jam by the Internet these days. Exactly. Pretty soon you don't even need to jam, get together with musicians anymore. You just get on the Internet, you see each other, everybody sees each other, and you just play. The <laughs> bass player, the drum, everybody just play, and you see each other on, what is that called, the uh, Uvu? <laughs> <laughs> what do they call it, Uvu or Skype? What is this thing now that you all see each other? And you, you oh, I just, don't know. I don't yeah, know. I guess you don't know about Uvu. Yeah, it's like a camera. You could like have five people on, the, on your screen on the computer, and you're all chatting and seeing each other at the same time. Okay. Uh, you haven't done that yet, huh? No, 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 no. Oh. Technology moves really fast, and it seems I'm like the older you. we get, the, the faster it moves. <laughs> uh, Brother Larry played with Curia and and Larry and Leo Rizzo, who went on to play with Debbie Gibson. And what was the drummer's name from that? Jack Cucalino. Oh, yes, yes, Jack. That's right. I, have you ever, ever seen him anymore? How's he doing? You hear from him? Uh, I talked with Jack, I think it was probably about four or five years ago. Wow. Uh, and actually, you know, I came back to New York, I want to say, when was that? Oh, man, brain goes. I think it, in, um, I think it was early 2000s, maybe, and um, Jack did a gig with me, doing my stuff. I don't think, I, you know, you know, you know what the problem is you, as you get older? When you say, oh yeah, 10 years ago, and you're referring to the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> and 10 years ago was not the 90s. So, yeah, exactly. I, I mean, I, even with the 80s, I'm like, yeah, yeah, a couple of years ago. Meantime, it's like, you know, 30 <laughs> years almost. <laughs> I can't remember if it was 2002 or three, or if it was like uh, 95. I wow, and speaking that. of the 90s, I remember when you came out with your first solo album. Yes, 1990. Right? 
1990, produced by Dave Whitman. Yes, Dave Whitman, great engineer, uh, producer, all-around guy. He engineered um, Rebel Yell. Uh, Billy Eric Idol Clapton. song, Billy Idol song, Rebel Yell. Yeah, the album, yeah, but the, the album, whole album he, right? Yeah, the album he engineered, um, I think, the first four Kiss albums. Um and Eric Clapton's Journeyman, I can't remember, I'm drawing a blank on it, but it's like a lot of uh, like great records, records you know. Yeah, yeah, all famous stuff. Mm-hmm. And this, this album I, I, is still one of my favorite albums. I'm holding it in my hand right now. Oh, thank and you. I listen to it constantly. I mean, every song on here is instrumental, but it's like almost I could sing it along. I'm like in the car, instead of singing like vocally singing, I'm going down, 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 down. I'm singing that as I'm driving. I'm like, wait, I'm not singing. I'm a lead guitar with my mouth right now, you know? <laughs> cool. Yeah. That's oh, it. man. This, every song on this album is phenomenal. And, and I'm not just saying that because you're my friend. I mean that because I could listen to – I put it on. I'm driving from beginning to end. It's like I won't go to skip a song. You know, I won't go – I don't feel like I can't track, too. It's like from beginning to end, you know? Oh, and, cool. Um, yeah. And and it's produced so well. I mean, the sound is incredible. Yeah. And yeah. I know I mean, you must have picked up from working with him. Uh-huh. You got got really good on your own. But then, in what was that? Nineteen, uh, nineteen. Uh, what is it here? Nineteen ninety four. You produced your own album, Mind, Body, and Soul. Uh, yeah. That has a lot. That had a lot to do with Mitch Diamond. Remember Mitch Diamond? Sure. Yeah, and Alan and Alan Plotkin. Um, those are the guys that you know that that engineered that record and and helped big time. And then I didn't really, I don't really say I started producing until until um, uh, even my Escape record. That just I fell into that record. I could not have not made that record. It just or it could not have not come out. It just was gonna. It was spilling out. Just the just the the whole circumstances. We don't have a, we don't have enough time on the radio to go into how that record came about, but. Um, it just happened. Uh, but later on, a few years later, is when I actually started producing. And that was to the escape. Uh, my acoustic record helped me realize that I could make a record. And um, I, after being frustrated with record companies and um, situations like that, that I just said I wanted to – I still love music. I, I want to do music. So if I can just do it myself, then I'll just do it. And that was before a lot of people – now now people make records at home all the time and stuff. So – now you and I can sit down with our cell phones and record a record. I have a 16-track digital recorder on my iPhone, and you can videotape, you, you know, shoot that, the making of the record, of the song, on your cell phone, and then we can upload it and get it out uh, on CD Baby by tomorrow morning if we wanted to and have a video up on YouTube. But in 95, 96, um, that wasn't, wasn't the, uh, the norm. And uh, Escape Escape came out, and like I said, I could have not. There's no way that record could have not come out. It's just one of those things where you 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 know just get out of the way, and it was going to come out. And but it came out in '95. I bought this CD. I'm holding it in my hand right now. I bought this. Uh, I was with my friend. My remember my friend Andy Lopez. Rest in peace. He passed away in '97. Oh, no. Me and him went to Slip Disc Records in Long Island. What is that? Wow. Merrick Road is it? I, I don't remember what street Slip it was on. I remember Slip Disc, but I don't remember what I don't remember what street it was on. Yeah, I think it's a Merrick, a Rockaway Avenue, uh, right off the Sunrise Highway. That's uh, right. And there was a place That's called Slip right. Disc, and uh, I walk in there, and right in front of me, I see your new album, and I immediately I bought it right away, and then I came home and called you, brother Larry. I just picked up your new CD at uh, Slip Disc, and I just talked about um, um, uh, Mind, Body, Soul. Uh, you you worked on Escape with Jeff Copeland on both records. Right, and mixed by Jeff Copeland? Yeah, Jeff mixed uh, Escape. Um, again, Escape just happened. I was trying to um, I was trying to get back to a good space. A friend of mine, Sam Raymond, gave me the keys to his house and said, you need to make a record. Go make a record. And um, so many people helped tell me what to do, what not to do, how to play. <laughs> you know, I, I believe I even called Nile Rogers and asked him about tips on recording and um everybody was extremely nice and uh i made people came down and played on the record on this uh, not escape not escape but the record i was trying to make mm-hmm. and um 
at, towards the end, I realized I just made a bad record, and it was not didn't sound good. It's just I didn't write any good songs. But at the same time, I had all these acoustic songs I had written, and so I started just recording that uh, as a relief for the stress that was going on with trying to make this electric record. Mm -hmm. And the acoustic record took two weeks to make. Like, it, no effort at all. And um, I had a cassette, because that's what we did. I did a rough mix of cassette, and I gave it to, I played it for my friend Jeff. We wanted to know how, how the other record was coming. And he he was like, uh, man, this sounds really good. Let me, let me mix this for you. <laughs> Won't you let me mix this? I'm like, let you mix it. Jeff mixes records for a living, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Sure, be my guest. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the way the record went. Cheryl, Cheryl Green, I think Cheryl's last name, she did the uh, graphic arts work. I got the film done um, for a friend of mine who, who would give me a birthday card, a uh, homemade graphic arts birthday card that said uh, good for one free job. And when I called it, it was years later, and she had a company with a huge staff, and she did the film output for me. Um, it was it was amazing. I got distribution through the people at J and R Music World. Um, it was licensed in Japan. There was a guy that it's just I, I, I can't even I can't even tell you. It's just one thing after the next that just said, all right, this has to come out. And it, <laughs> as you know, that record is completely different than the first two. Oh yeah, well you know yeah. I, I knew that right away when I first got it because it was a lot more mellow and. Mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of cool, too, because it was interesting to me that, you know, the first two are real hard rock guitar stuff and really, you know, heavy. And, and then when I got this and it was mellow, it, at the first time I was like, oh, I didn't, I didn't expect it to be so mellow. But at the same time, I did because the cover is you playing an acoustic guitar sitting on a stool. So yeah, I, said, I mean, that, that must represent what the album is all about. Yeah. So it was kind of, it, it didn't uh, disappoint me. It was kind of different. I said, okay, well, Larry tried the acoustic record. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's fine. It's you know, I thought my, it was great. It's actually my most popular record still today. Yeah, but there's a lot of a lot more, more. Sometimes when you do stuff acoustically, mm -hmm. you, you reach more of a bigger audience because, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the rock people are. Um, yeah, no, what I'm trying to say is like when you do stuff that's mellower, you know, you get the, you get a, more of a bigger audience. The, the, the rock people will like it, and the older people or people who just like Barry Manilow type of stuff will like that as well. <laughs> yes. You yes. know what I mean? Sure, absolutely. That's why even when me, when I write songs, I had my hard rock songs, but then I had my real ballads. I mean, for people that don't know, me and Larry also. Uh, Worked together. He produced two of my songs that we did on a four-track, uh, four-track thing that I had that was falling apart. We had to use another cassette player to rewind it because the rewind it didn't work. If you remember that. I remember that. Hey, isn't that the opening song? Is that your opening song? Oh, that's the opening song. Can't live without you. But that's a different version. Me and you tried another version. We did a slower one. The oh, one, the opening right. one is the harder rock one. And uh -huh. when me and you, I tried to do a different approach because at that time. Ron Beanstock, the music lawyer, was uh, looking uh -huh. for, you know, was talking about maybe uh, shopping some of my songs to publishing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was trying to, like, you know, he told me to ease it up. Don't make it so rock. Make it where people could uh, relate to it and, and mellow it out a little bit, where country people, country artists could hear it and say, oh, I like that song. Or if they hear it, the rock version, like I say, some people just can't hear a song for what it is, you know. So that's yeah. why when me and you produced, when you produced uh I did Can't Love Without You again with you and Carry On again. We we did a, a mellower, slower version, which they came out great. Okay. Yeah. You know? Cool. Yeah, yeah, I still have those. And um, yeah, me and Larry worked together. Uh, I got to tell you a quick funny story about working when I worked with you, Larry. I left your house when you lived in Manhattan. It was Ninth Avenue, I remember. Oh yeah, London Te London Terrace. Yeah, London. Yeah. London. Chelsea. I, and, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I had this car, a New Yorker, that. One, every once in a while, I go back to the car and the key. I'm trying to keep it wouldn't start, so I had to have somebody hit the starter. I had to hit the starter with the crowbar while somebody turned the key. And that's the only <laughs> way it could start. So here I am. I just left your house after recording with you for a few hours. I go downstairs. Here goes this big guy, me with long hair, asking people on the street. I have a crowbar in my hand, and I'm asking people walking by, "Could you please sit in my car and turn the key while I hit the, this?" The starter. <laughs> Three of them got scared and started running. Of course, in that neighborhood, yeah. especially. 
this big long head guy with a crowbar and saying, hey, excuse me, could you please get in my car? <laughs> and then what? Ah! Finally, one guy must have understood he might have had, maybe he had the same problem. He got in, and I whacked the start, and we started, and I was able to get home. Or else I probably would have had to sleep over the house. Wow. I never knew that. <laughs> I never told you. I was too embarrassed. <laughs> But okay, you know what? Uh, I want to get back to some of your old music, but let's talk about. Uh, I want to play one of your songs right now that's new, called "World Come in, World Come Together." That's yes. new, mm-hmm. and uh, that's- maybe you want to t- say a few things about it before we play it. Sure, it's off the new record that came out last year called "The Rhythm of Life," and um, it's. Uh, I started doing a new record, and uh, actually, we're going to play a song. You're going to play a song later, I think, which is uh, what helps start me doing the new record um, all right so uh, uh i get to joanne probably has it queued up uh let's uh let's uh let's sit back and enjoy this uh new tune by brother larry mitchell called world come together yeah thanks Thank you. 
Yeah, baby. <laughs> brother Larry. Still rocking as good as always, brother. That sounds oh, great, you. man. Thank you. And fingers are flowing. I mean, I, how do you do it, brother? I mean, I, I, my fingers, I have arthritis. I can't even move anymore. <laughs> 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 uh, I don't know about that. Uh, we I'm have to play next time, next time I come to New York. You gotta, we got to play. Yeah, that that would be great. I mean, people that, uh, for people who might not know, on YouTube, there's uh, quite a few videos of me and Larry jamming at February. It's in, like, 1987. Oh, I, I sent those yeah. uh, to Joanne before. Also, uh, when you were running your jam, uh, I think that was, like, 1997 or 98, you were running a jam uh, when uh, you were doing it with uh, Mark White, the bass player. Oh, from the- yeah. You remember? Do you, were you ever there when Dave Chappelle used to come down and sing all, all the filthy lyrics? All the time, all the time. He used to come down. <laughs> David Chappelle used to come down. The people love this story. He used to he come. He would do a show upstairs, right? Yep. He would do the Boston Comedy Club, and then they asked him to stop coming down to where we were because he was drawing too many people from the comedy club. <laughs> <laughs> I was there almost like every time, yeah. and he would be. I remember he called you a uh, Paulie Mitchell. He would call me uh, Frankie Searcher. <laughs> he would mess up, always mess up everybody's first name. <laughs> and he would sing, and, and Larry would be playing the blues. I remember we did a blues, and he wow. would just curse. I don't want to curse on the air, even though there's internet radio and you can, but I never do because yeah. you never know who's listening. I don't want to. Nobody to get insulted. But he would me, me and Larry would be playing a little blues in a, and he would just sing and go, yeah. Yeah, baby, I'm a comedian. He would sing the most filthy lyrics you could possibly Right, and he would say, Mother F, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I had some of that on video, but I did have some stuff of us on video with uh, with uh, Mark White. Yeah. Mark White, uh, for people out there who don't know Mark White is, he was the bass player for the Spin Doctors. Yep. And, and he was the bass player for Larry Mitchell on his own uh, open mic jam. What night was that on? I don't remember. I think it was on a Sunday. On a Sunday night, you used I to do that. I wonder if it was a Sunday. And that was in the village. Right? What, what was that on Bleecker Street? Uh, I, I, no, uh, it was on, somewhere uh, around there by St. Mark. I, I don't remember. I think it was McDougal Street. It was, it was uh, the Bagot Inn, which was underneath uh, the Comedy Club. Was it? <laughs> That's was right. It now Boston I remember it perfectly. I, I don't remember the name of the Comedy Club. Yeah, I yeah, and, and David Chappelle. Yeah, I mean, there might be people out there who don't know who don't know who David Chappelle is, and there's uh, millions of people who do know. But yeah. for those who don't know, he was uh, what, he was the star of that movie Robin Hood and Tights, right? Uh, Didn't he do that I movie Robin so. Hood and Tights or something he, like he's that? He's been a couple of movies, but he has TV. I think most people know him from his own TV show. Yeah. Right. He had his own TV show, which is like uh, tons of uh, you know the box sets of him on DVD in stores. Yeah. And yeah, he used to come down there every time and. Call Larry, Paulie Mitchell, and call me Frankie Sal. Mess up everybody's names. Of course, he he was kind of. Uh, you know, it looked like he had quite a few, right? <laughs> he was he was not feeling any any pain. He was good. He was not feeling any pain at all. <laughs> so uh, t- tell me, uh, let's get back here now. Um, now I have another CD. And then you came out with uh, Temptation. I had right? the right CD called CD Temptation. I, yeah, the first, that was the first CD when I was starting to put together a studio. When I moved to San Diego, and you, this looks like a bunch of songs from like different years, right? What did you have songs from 1990, 91, yeah, 94, 96, record, 97? Like you put all stuff together yeah. that you probably wrote in those years, but just put them all together on this album. Well, my first the, my first record was tied up from the record company. They wouldn't sell me the rights. They wouldn't give me the rights. They wouldn't re- put it out or anything like that. So. Um, and then the second record, uh, my second record came out on three labels. Three labels closed after eight mo- eight months of uh, the record being out. So it was it was a weird it was a weird thing. It came out Wade and Green, and they closed their record label. Uh, they were up in New Hampshire. They closed the label and turned me on to Guitar Player Magazine, and it came out on Guitar Player Magazine for eight months. And uh, then Guitar Player Magazine closed their label, and they said, hey, we're friends with this guy, Jesse Colling Young. Do you remember Jesse Colling Young? I said, yes. And so Jesse had a label called Rich Top Records, I believe. And so Jesse put uh, Mind, Body, Soul out on his record. And then uh, uh, eight months later, his label went out, and um, what do you call it? Uh, uh uh, I couldn't get any copies of the record, so I did Temptation as kind of like a, because I was still playing, so it was kind of a uh, best of of those two records. 
Mm-hmm. And then on Temptation, there's three songs that aren't on any other record. And um, it's Grace, which I still play uh, live all the time now. And uh, uh, Kisses in the Rain, which was a little bit mellower. I haven't played that in years. And Simple Pleasures, which I still play every now and then. Mm-hmm. And that, that's Temptation. And then after Temptation, I did uh, Insatiable. And yes, I have that over here, too. I have... I have all your stuff here, brother, cool. except for the new stuff. I gotta get the new stuff, and uh, you gotta tell me how to get a hold of that. I'll even buy it online or whatever. No, and all, yeah, this was insatiable. All you, you produced, arranged, performed, or everything was done by you, mm-hmm. except for uh, in, in, uh, in what is this? And I oh, can't no. see, man. These are so small. These things. Uh, Temptation is all me. Uh, insatiable is not necessarily all me. James East um is a bass player from San Diego. He played on quite a few songs. Uh his brother is a um well known bass player, Nathan East. And James Nathan is East. Great. I know Nathan East, I yeah. remember him. Yeah, James is a great bass player uh, as well. And uh Martin Greaves played uh keyboards on a few songs. Um Adrian Nims played uh saxophone on two songs, I believe. Greg Gerson, you remember Greg Gerson? Yes, of course. How's he hey. doing? You talk to him? Yeah, really? I haven't talked to Greg in a while, but Greg, we knew as a drummer, but he he was out in San Diego, and he, I remember him coming by the, the studio, and he was like, hey, you should let me play flute on this song. And I'm like, flute? I didn't know that Greg played on, like, Luther Vandross records. He played flute and stuff. He's a, you know, well-known rock drummer. <laughs> um, so Greg's playing flute, not drums on the record. He's playing flute on the song. Um, Monette Marino is uh, playing percussion in a few songs. So Insatiable has lots of different. Uh, it's mostly me, but there's lots of people that, that guest uh, performed on it in various spots. Mm-hmm. And then the record after that, um, Sonic Temple, is all me, as with the help of technology and loops and uh, lots of programming and live playing and all kinds of stuff. So it was a really a it's like let let me how can I take advantage of technology today. And uh, it's yeah. a fun record. And then the new record, Rhythm Rhythm of Life, has um, Russ uh, Garner and Austin Solomon from my uh, current band playing, as well as some program stuff like I normally do. And um, it was weird. I started getting messages from drummers that I know. You know, I know. I as you know, I, I know some great drummers around the world. And um, so Near Z is playing on a, a track on a line. Um, Jeff Bowders. Really great drummer. We played some live shows with him before. Uh, he's playing on uh, several songs, River and um, uh, Under the Bridge, and maybe he's playing on a couple more songs. I'm trying to think. Drawing a blank right now. Um, like I said, Russ is playing on some songs. Uh, Otmar Noor, who played on a song, but I got the track too late. Um, he's in Poland. He did the tracks via Poland, but you know, via the internet, and um, some great drumming on it. Uh huh. Now, now the song "Light of Little Loves." What, how did this come about? Is this on your new record as well? That's on the new record, "Rhythm of Life," and um, I produced a singer named Randy Driscoll, mm-hmm. and um, she called me up. And right after the shooting in um, was it Newtown, Connecticut? Right. And um, she was putting together a record to benefit. All the proceeds were going to uh, an organization to help the children there. Um, and uh, she asked me to do a song. So I did that track in probably an evening. And the next morning I listened to it again and finished it up. And they sent it to her, and they put her on the record, and everybody really liked it. And that was the the uh, incentive for me to, to start doing another record. And then I started doing another record, and I decided to put that, since that was really what sparked the, the new record, I decided to put that song on the, on the new record as well. No, no. If there's any, like, hopefully there's twenty thousand people listening. If anybody wants to buy your CDs, the old or new ones? How could they do that? Is there a website, or do you have your own website that you sell your CDs, or is there a certain store or something like that? Uh, well, you can. Most most things are electronic these days. Um, I sell That's what CDs I mean. That's... Even Julian Lennon, I talked to him the other day. He's selling yeah. his own CD as well on his own website. So I figure you're probably doing the same. Okay. Does Julian have a new CD out? Yes, yes, yeah. I talked to him. I was chatting with him the other day on Facebook, and he has a new CD out. Oh, wow. And I okay. asked Julian, I said, where can I buy it? He goes, I, I said, what store can I get out of He goes, writes me back saying, my store, brother, and he sends me the website. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Cool. Well, tell Julian I said hello. That's cool. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. He's on Facebook. He's out there. Everybody's on Facebook. You know, years ago, you know, back in the old days, it's like, how do you, how do you meet 
a celebrity or, or somebody in music or an actor. Now every, everybody on the planet's on Facebook. It's like you just yeah. write them, hey, how you doing, brother? Yeah. Yeah. Of course, I mean, you remember you hung out with Julian also many years in the China Club with us. And yeah, I'm gonna see. I'm gonna hang out with Alan Childs uh, either tomorrow or probably Tuesday or Wednesday. Oh, brother Alan <laughs> Childs, I love him. I, he's doing. I, I, he was. He was always down third. He used to crack me up because he told me some great stories. He said, "Sal, you know this music business it, it kills." Me. He goes, "Cause he, you know Alan Childs also played drums with David Bowie for yeah. for tours." And he said to me, he said, Sal, you know, the music business is one day I'm playing Madison Square Garden with David Bowie, and we're getting treated like the kings and the VIPs. And, you know, and then when the tour is over, I'm playing drums for a wedding band, and some old man is telling me, hey, schmuck, bring those drums around the back, not through the front, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it just goes yeah. to show, you know, it's like one day you're a superstar, and the next day, you know, you're out there uh, playing you know, just like anything else, I'm, I do a movie or I do music, and then I have to go do some work because you know we're not uh, we're not making millions. You know, it would no, be nice. It's all part of doing you know doing what you love. So. Yeah. So he cracked yeah. me out with that story. I said, "You're so yeah. right, Alan." Then one day, you know, you're a superstar. The next day, when the tours are over and you got to make a, you know some extra money playing with bands or whatever in the, in the local club and or just a wedding band, people do that. I know many people who are rock stars and on, when they're done. Not working, you yeah. know, play with, with, with whatever they could do, you know, to make a living. And got to eat. You got to eat. And then he said, one day I'm I'm treated like a, a big star. The next day, some old man in the tuxedo saying, "Hey, bring those drums around the back. Don't bring those over here, damn it!" You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so okay, then, you know what? I want to play the song for everybody here. Light okay. of, li- uh, of little loves. Okay, I was no. just going to say that uh, you can you can that you can buy the CD uh, at iTunes Store, um, Amazon.com. <laughs> And quite a few other stores. You can stream it and listen to it on Spotify, I believe. Um, and also, it's uh, streaming. It's on my uh, my website, LarryMitchell.com. You can listen to it there. And also, on uh, most of the songs are up on Reverb Nation as well. If you're up on that. Yeah, everything's happening on the the internet is the new uh, thing, man. It's like you know, if you if you want to get a record deal, you have to have 50 billion views on YouTube, and then they'll think about it. So, <laughs> okay, yeah. with no further ado, let's hear "Light of Little Love" by okay. Larry Mitchell. All right, thanks, Al.
Wow, was that it? Uh, I, was, I thought I was ready to... Uh, I'm still here, am I? Are we still here? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I thought I was, I was waiting. I thought it was going to go on for a little bit longer. That was pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah, was, that was good, man. I liked that. Kind you. of... Uh, I felt like I was like floating there with the angels there with that one. Ah. Well, the heavy subject, remember? Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's beautiful, man, and uh, I like the voices. Very, very, it's one of the few that I've heard from you that has actual voices on it. You know, your, your stuff is well, usually all instrumental sound. most of the time. Yeah, that's the keyboard sound. Oh, it was. It's I yeah. thought it was real, real uh, girls singing like in the choir or something like that. Those are keyboard voices. Keyboard voices. Technology. Oh, <laughs> I'm gonna have to record and let some keyboard do the vocals for me because these days, man, I don't think I could sing a full song anymore without the, you know, <laughs> without my losing my voice. I bet you could. You, you know, I could still do it. You know what it is? I was even talking to Robin Zander the other day. You know Robin Zander from Cheap Trick. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, he he was talking. And he said, you know, he's playing with Steve Longo now and Mark Hitt. And he says, I got. I wants to keep singing almost every day, even when he's not playing. With, even if he's playing with Cheap Trick on his days off, he'll play with the Robin Zander band because, as a singer, he has to keep singing. Because he he said, you know, if you lay lay off it for a week, you start to lose it. And it's the truth. With even me, I haven't sang like I used. To. I used to sing all week long with cover bands, the open mic jams with my band, and my voice was the song would just flow out like it was nothing. Now it's like I talk and I start losing my voice. <laughs> this comes with old age, huh? Nah, you just got to do more. Yeah, exactly. It's the truth. It's with anything. It's just like working out. It's like a muscle. You know, you work out, you keep your body in shape, and if you don't do it for a while, you know, then it's like, oh, you can't even lift them. So it's the same thing like with the vocals, you know? Mm. So now we still have another song we want to play. Okay. This, this, this is unbelievable how fast the show is going, huh? Yeah, I just realized, I just looked at the clock. Well, I'm, I'm unbelievable. Well, we could go a little bit over. We could go a little bit over. We'll talk about now. Uh, let's talk about now Shadow Hawk is about what? Is, is this a, just a, a something you just wrote, or is it like we're inspired by anything for, the, for this um, next? It's, uh, I, would, I was uh, consciously trying to get a little bluesier on this record. Mm-hmm. And um, I have a thing. You know, I produce a lot of, of Native American artists, and I play live with some Native American artists still. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, uh, I was reading about that on your website. Mm-hmm. And for the last two years, I have a thing with hawks. And um, so I get in the car and I drive, and hawks fly by. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard to explain, but... Um, you, are you really seeing them, or is this oh, just yeah. your imagination? Well, uh, you know, I, I think I, I, I see them. I, you know, I could, I might need to go get, you know, speak to a therapist for a little bit, I guess. I don't know. but Now you kind of reminded think... me of Jim Morrison when he used to see, like, the dancing Indian in the street all the time. And, mm-hmm. and remember that? Did you see the movie where uh, Jim yeah. Morrison always saw, like, this Indian guy dancing in the street? and mm-hmm. I think it, it must have been just in his head, right? I mean... But you maybe you know I saw an owl yesterday in the, in the middle of snow. Mm-hmm. I thought it was going crazy. I said that's an owl. An yeah. owl was hanging out in the snow. Yeah. Well, I have I have witnesses that that are with me when we we see a hawk and. Oh, okay. So like, you oh, have witnesses that is definitely yeah. happening. Yeah. Yeah. For, <laughs> okay. For, so for, now you you got this hawk thing going on. So yeah. that's what inspired you to, to write this next song. Shadow hawk. Yep. There you wow. Go. Would you, you think we should play it right now, or, and, uh, or should we wait a few more minutes? I think we wait a little bit. Let's talk some more. What have you All right, doing? man. Brother Larry Mitchell's on the roll tonight, baby. So tell us when your next tour is going to start and when you plan on getting back out there so I could come see you. I saw Larry, what was that, at uh, in Long Island? How, how, what was that, about three or four months ago? Yeah, K.J. Farrell's October, I want to say October or something, October 10th, 7th, 8th, 9th. One of those days. Yeah, it was. Uh, I think it was a Thursday night, and um, it was great, man. I had a ball. It's like it was so long that I was in the club scene. I mean, I haven't really hung out in clubs or bars in so long. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. And going to see you play, I think you were the first person I went to go see you play in years. Oh, cool. Thank you. I'm glad you came out. Yeah, and that's because you were so close to my house. <laughs> <laughs> it was a fun night. It was a no, fun well, night. you know, I would have traveled a little far to see Brother Larry. I would have went to Manhattan. I would come to Alabama might be a little hard, but uh, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you were right by my house. It was a night that I wasn't home. working. I said, oh, man, this is perfect. i got to go see Brother Larry and surprise <laughs> him, you know? <laughs> cool. And the great thing is I ran into so many people oh, from okay. the old China Club days and the old, you know, 
hanging on in the old days. They, you know, uh, what's his name? Dale? What was the name? Um, what, what was it? The woman with the red hair. I keep forgetting. I can't think of it right now. Uh, she's Melissa? always at your shows. She was uh, standing by with her daughter, Melissa? still selling your CDs at the table there. Yeah, Melissa Mermaid. Melissa, she's going to kill me, but she's probably listening. Sal, how could you forget my name? We're on Facebook. But you know what it is? When you're on the radio, you're trying to think of all these things, and sometimes you get a, what do you call it, lip lock, or what do you call that? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I ran, saw her again for after all those years. And oh, yeah, no, it's great. Right. I people. love coming back to play New York because it's like just old old school reunion kind of thing. It's great. Yeah, so so what are your plans for people who may be listening like in the New York area? Oh, where's your tour going to start? I mean, you you tour around pretty much uh, a lot of different places. Yeah, well, we're starting up the 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 uh, band starts up touring again in the spring. I think we're going to do a, a short run, a very short run in February, um, and then we'll start up again in spring. Um, tomorrow morning, I leave for Vegas, Las Vegas, New Mexico, where it's a lot warmer than it is here in Alabama right now. Um, and I'll be playing at the CES show, the show, part of CES, from from my friend um, John Whitledge and his magic bus. So basically I'm playing uh, to tracks by myself um, through a van that has the world's greatest car stereo system in it. And it's if you're at CES, please come by and check it out. It's pretty cool. And then I'll be at the NAMM show playing with um, some guys I play with up in Seattle, Charlie Lorme and um, Jeff Eason. And we got some special guests going to sit in with us, and that's going to be cool. And then I go do some workshops at uh, Montgomery College in um, in Maryland, Rockville, Maryland, in um, February and March. And I'm going to produce a, a Native American artist there, Dawn Avery. And, um, and then I'll be back, and we'll start up the tour, spring. And it'll probably go through the summer, and um, I'll take another break to produce another record uh, for someone else, and try and squeeze in a record for myself at, uh, somewhere along the line. And um, and then we'll pick back up again in probably the the winter, beginning or the fall, I should say. Mm-hmm. So uh, we'll be back out in New York area, uh, probably the spring. Well, that's great. So everybody who's listening out there, you heard that. If anybody's living in Vegas. That could be tuned in right now. You, you heard Brother Larry. you got to go check him out. I'll be at the Flamingo. All the Flamingo. Yeah, I'll be baby. here all week. Try to veal. <laughs> <laughs> well, stay away from the slot machines now, you know. Well, then again, you might hit the jackpot, brother. You, uh, know. you know, I don't I don't really gamble either. <laughs> oh, me too. I'm a crybaby. As soon as I lose five bucks, I'm like, okay, this machine owns me $5. <laughs> My wife don't mind. She pops in the hundreds like they're going out of style. Me, I wow. stay in the room and, and I bring my acoustic guitar and I play guitar and stay in the room and <laughs> stay away from the machines because I, I'm a crybaby. I, I can't. I lose five bucks and I'm crying all night long. <laughs> you know? How about you? Want, would you? How about everybody? I mean, I know they're all jumping for joy right now. We want to hear Shadow Hawk. Should we let them hear Shadow Hawk, brother? Sure. That's great. All right. Sounds good to me. Let's let's uh, let's sit back and enjoy Shadow Hawk. Okay. show I'd like to thank Larry Mitchell. You there, Larry? I'm here. Thank you, Sal, for having me on. Oh, no, thank you, man. You're the best. This has been the Sal Searchia Show with my guest, one of the best guitar players on the whole planet, Larry Mitchell, and we say cheers to you all, and thank you for tuning in.
Thank you for listening. This has been a Mathis Media Hub production.